It is the beginning of Holy Week, and this is a set-aside time. That's what holiness means, right? It's something that has been set aside, and so at around 11 o'clock today, you will be receiving an email. In that email will be, oh wait, what's that? You say, wait, I don't receive church emails. Change it, all right? Go outside and change it. You can even, when the sermon starts to lull because I forgot where I was at, you can go outside, you can scan the QR code, you can sign up. Even before 11 o'clock, you can get it done, all right? So, so at 11 o'clock, in your inbox will be um, a Holy Week reading guide, all right? It's going to show up on your phone as uh, something that you just have to go like two screens on. It'll have days of the week. You can tap on those days of the week, and that will lead you to readings, all right? I want you to read along with that. Why? Because in Holy Week, God is actually calling you to set this time aside for him, okay? So do that. Read along. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm not going to sign up for the email. I won't forgive you just yet, but I will tell you this, that you can go to the church website where you will also find this exact same reading scheme. Now, if you've never been to the church website and you're over the age of 16 but under the age of 70, then shame on you. Get to the church website, okay? (laughs) And then lastly, if you're part of a family group, family group, talk to, jo- to, to Jono, sorry, I have couples names for the pastors, sorry, that's my bad. Jono, talk to Jono, and he'll let you know what's up with family group. But your family group leader will also pass out this guide to you. All right, we good? All right. All right, I'm going to start off by reading our main passage this morning. Worship team, thank you so much for uh, reading all the supplementary stuff that we needed. I'll probably touch on it again, but if you miss that, once again, I hate to say it, but shame on you. You should have got here earlier, and then you would have heard it, all right? All right. John chapter 12, verse 12 to 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, otherwise translated, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. That is, they continued to gossip about it. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let me pray for us to get us started. Father God, this morning we ask that through your word and by your Holy Spirit, you would open up our eyes that we would see Jesus clearly for who he claims to be for each of us. God, we will thank you for that. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, Rooted Fellowship, what rules over you? I'm going to be tying together a little bit our two kingdoms and our church and empire. What rules over you? What reigns over you? Is it your your appetites and your desires, your addictions? Is it a fear that you will never know your true potential? And so you push forward, not really caring about your neighbor. Is it fear of some other kind? Maybe it's the law that rules over you. And I don't just mean the biblical law. Maybe it's an obsession that whispers in your ear, self, if we do this right, the way that people expect us to, 
then we will have success. For you holy people out there, maybe you are saying, no, Wade, I love the law of the Lord. I meditate upon it day and night. Good for you. <laughs> All the while, you are clinging to whatever law you think will be the greatest amount of benefit to you before the face of God. We both know the truth, don't we? Just like God's first people being rescued from slavery in Egypt, we are quick to forget who redeems us. We are quick to ignore who it is that we belong to. The old way or an old way of describing faith is whatever it is that we put our fear, love, and trust in above all things. So what is it that you put all your fear, love, and trust into? Anything that seems good, necessary, I dare say expedient. What's the next best thing right now that's going to get me exactly to where I want to be? Second order consequences be damned. This morning, we will hear about Jesus from the prophet Zechariah. God's people in Zechariah's time were brought back into the land that God had provided for them, and it looked like this was going to be a great thing. It looked like, finally, all the promises of God were going to come true for them. But unfortunately, when they settled into the rubble, all they ended up getting was a failing construction project and a bunch of priests standing around them saying, be holy, because you should be, and then God will bless us more. And then what happened? Well, then they started fighting amongst themselves. There was some hair pulling involved. And generally, they forgot about God's promises, and they refused to work for the good of their community, their country, and their neighbors. So what rules you? In our text this morning, Jesus, right now, is riding in on a donkey. Would you go to him? Now, this isn't a litmus test. I'm not actually challenging you. Maybe we would, if we were nearby, if we knew what was happening, we could rip someone's palm branches off their tree quick enough. <laughs> but let's be honest, I mean, we'd probably be looking for the right angle of selfie the whole time it's going on, right? Let's say you join along with everyone else saying, Hosanna, save us now. We're all thinking the same thing, right? Not so fast. John tells us why everyone decided to go along and follow after Jesus and join the parade that day. It's because they had heard about what he had done for this man, Lazarus, and raised him up from the dead. Well, if he can raise a man from the dead, then surely he can fix my family problem that I've got going on right now. If he can raise a man from the dead, then surely uh, this financial hole that I've dug for myself, he can, he's definitely going to pull me out of that. Surely all the things that we fear, love, and trust more than this Jesus character, he can help us out from under the weight of them all the weight of our ambitions and failures so that we can keep on clinging to them with a clean conscience. Pastor One usually calls these things idols. True, good. What is an idol? It's a symbol for something, a god. Rooted fellowship. I'm going to up the ante just a little bit this morning. What are we talking about? What am I talking about? What am I going on about? Your gods, our gods. Those things that we willfully put all of our fear, love, and trust into. And hope, just hope, that maybe Jesus will let us keep both them and him. 
Last week we were talking about election season, right? All right, they're talking a little bit about election season here too. You see a man riding on a donkey. Someone else rode on a donkey. His name was Solomon. Solomon, the king of Israel. He rode in on a donkey. Maybe, just maybe, this is the one. This is the guy that's going to come in. He's going to be our revolutionary king who frees us from the slavery that we're in to Rome. Everyone had an idea about what Jesus could do for them, just like you and me. And so we run out and we say, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. But we're all under the rule of something. Maybe it's something simple. Maybe it's just so simple that it's something like that group of people that ah, at work or at school, I know that I could fit in with this group of people. I know that I could fake it to make it long enough for them to know that I'm as intelligent as what they think they are. And so I'm just going to keep striving for it. Or maybe you experience something like this, the fact that you, Christian, have had the name of Jesus placed upon you, and all of a sudden you don't fit in in all the places that you used to fit in. And the thing that it's going to cost you to fit back into your social group the way that you used to, the thing that it costs you to fit into your culture group the way that it used to, ah, it might just cost you your soul. And instead, when we do that, we're, we're actually working against the good gifts that God has given to us. Those people that are sitting behind and front beside you right now might not look like you, might not sound like you. They might be a little bit strange. <laughs> hmm? Yes, you are. Okay. And, 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 yet that is who God has gifted to you. There is a people that you fit in with, whether you like it or not. Christians are a bit weird, I'll admit that. <laughs> but maybe you decide you're just going to keep on laboring to slot right in, to be that person that everyone knows that you should be, because then you will be secure. Then you'll always have a safety net, and then all of your fear, love, and trust can be put in those around you. You're forgetting that the person sitting next to you is there to offer you always the forgiveness of Jesus. You know where you're not going to find forgiveness? For most of us, anyway. In your social and your culture group. How easy is it to sin against those people that are just like you? Really easy. Yeah? And how much do those people love to have just a little bit of dirt on you? Yeah, just a little bit of dirt. That way, they can rule over you. And you can fear them. And then maybe you can get that same dirt on somebody else and you can rule over them. And they will place all of their fear, love, and trust in you, hoping that you don't betray them. That is the beauty of Jesus' transcultural salvation. Something that reaches into, through, and speaks to each and every people group everywhere. That's the beauty of his church. Or maybe, like so many people in the crowd that day, you would cry out, save us now. Because you looked at the miracles that he was able to perform and you heard of Lazarus being raised from the dead and you say, that's what I need. I need that ticket out of this fear of death and sickness. Save us now. I will do anything for you, man riding on donkey that I've heard called Jesus. I will sacrifice anything to you because you are going to be our king. Ah. 
This is the way that we view God's. This is the way that us old Adam and Eve sinners think the world works. That if we just give enough of ourselves, or if we just sacrifice enough of our darlings to this world, then surely we're going to get back something good in return. And Jesus is on a donkey, riding by, understanding that everyone else have, has a different use for him. Jesus is riding by knowing that he is the one that is going to be sacrificed. So as we come to our text this morning, understand who you are. All of us have something rule, ruling over us, and we are all going to be thinking that we need to be saved from something. If you were to go out on the street right now, almost everyone you would meet would say they need to be saved from something, and the very last thing that they think they would need to be saved from is their sin. That's why what Jesus is doing this morning is subversive. Not because it flies in the face of the Pharisees, although that's what they think. Not because it flies in the face of the Roman overlords, even though that's what they think. No, those are just byproducts of Jesus' primary work this week, and that is the forgiving of your sins. He's coming this morning on a donkey, and he is saying, I am here, I am just, and I have salvation for you. Jesus is just and is here with salvation for you. Verse 12, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So what do we know? We know that it's the next day. That's weird. <laughs> That's because we're only reading a small part of the text. What is this the day after? This is the day after that Jesus has begun the process of being prepared for death and burial. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, has come and washed Jesus' feet with an oil perfume. She's used her hair to wipe it up. Why is she doing this? Well, she's doing it to honor him. Why does he let her do it? Because he knows that he's going to the grave and his body needs to be prepared. We also know that it's feast time. Everyone is preparing to celebrate and observe the Passover. When God rescued his people out of Egypt. When he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. In the beginning of all of this, People heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, and so they took branches and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, or save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. This comes from Psalm 118, which was read for us this morning. Could be translated, save us, we pray, O Lord, or save us now, O Lord. We pray, give us success. It's kind of an odd translation. God's people, what was their success tied to? A better translation would be, Lord, give us your unfailing and continued faithfulness. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Now, I love John here. John uh, cuts through a lot of the red tape that the other gospel writers have. We don't get a lot of details about where the donkey came from, when Jesus said to go and get it, why he said to go get it. it just, John just says that it happens. Why? That story's been told. He's telling a different story. He's emphasizing something different for us this morning. And what is he going to emphasize specifically? Well, verse 15, we see it. It's a deep cut from the prophet Zechariah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, or look, open your eyes. Your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Let me read it directly from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, 
O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We're going to come back to this donkey just now, okay? I'm not going to forget, I promise. Because I do love donkeys. Um, They're cute. They're cute. Have you ever seen one? Yeah. A foal, especially. They got big ears. Oh, they're beautiful. And so our big idea, which you, you'll see behind us there, comes from verse 9 of Zechariah. Righteous and having salvation is he. We need to work with this translation a little bit. I, I want you to see how we got to this big idea, because it's going to be very important for the rest of Holy Week. Are you with me? All right, you, you ready to work with my jumbled brain that has a ton of words in it right now? Yes? Okay. You can just pretend. That's fine. I'll take it. All right, here's what we know about Jesus. He's not just righteous. Yeah? Now, he is righteous, but he's more than that. Jesus isn't just riding by on a donkey saying, like the Pharisees, ha, huh, Look at all the righteousness that I have. No. And he's not just coming with salvation, or, or, or um, I forget the, the other translation here. Um, you know, it doesn't matter because I don't like it anyway. Okay, I don't like it. He's not just having salvation. There it is. He's not just like carrying salvation, saying, oh, look at all the righteousness that I carry. Oh, look at the salvation that I have. No, no, no. This is a different kind of righteousness that we're talking about. It's a righteousness that he can give to you, that he wants to give to you, that he's going to go to the cross and give to you. It's a salvation that he's not just holding, saying, look at this beautiful salvation. He's saying it's yours. And so he comes just this morning. Now, just, I like this translation better. Why? Do do you know this word that we use, justified? Justified. It means being declared right and righteous before the eyes of God, forgiven of all your sin. And so I like this word just for that reason. We want to use it. And yet we also need to understand that um, just isn't always a good thing, right? Why? Because you're a sinner. That's why. Just means that you're going to be condemned. And so we need to hear that Jesus is just. And he's coming with salvation. For who? For you, Rooted Fellowship. And for everyone there on that hill that day as Jesus is marching up on a donkey. What do you want in a king? Uh, Okay, I come from America. We said no to kings and queens. Okay, we did. Most, a lot of people are nowadays, no more kings and queens. There's some people out there that are saying, oh, I like the idea of a king, yeah? Which makes it difficult then because you might remember from the Old Testament, do you know this story? When, when God's people said, give us a king, and the prophet said, ah, woo. okay, I don't know if you know what you're asking for. Because the king, what he's going to do is he's going to take your sons, he's going to send them off the war, and they're going to die. He's going to take your daughters for his wives, and then he's going to take your land, and then he's going to tax you. To which all of God's people said, amen. <laughs> and, yet, and yet, this morning, we're getting a little bit of a repeat of this. What are people wanting to see? Oh, Hosanna, even the king of Israel, save us now. They want a king. They want a king. What they don't know is what Jesus wants to do, what he's going to do, is he's not just going to be a just king. He's going to be a king that dies for them and justly, (laughs) he's going to justify them. He's going to give off all of his righteousness to them. He's going to put it on them. Okay, so here, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 this morning Let me, take, I, let me take my breath. Can I take my breath for a second? I need to take a drink of water. I need to catch up to where I'm at. 
Mm. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Jesus isn't just here to make a statement. He's not here for, for people to fall over and praise him for the miraculous things that he did. He's not there for the, the fawning of the people. He's not there for the, the fanning of the palm branches. <laughs> He's there to take on their sin. Remember all those things that we said at the beginning that we're fearing? that we're clinging on to, that we're looking for Jesus to save us from. Jesus feels all this coming from the crowd. He knows what's up. And you know what he's doing? He's accepting it all as a confession of their sinfulness. What does a donkey do? I mean, Solomon rode one in. Why? Why would a king? All the other kings, they rode war horses. Why a donkey? Well, whether Solomon did a good job at this or not, he was saying, people, my people, I'm here to carry your burdens. I'm going to take all the weight of my people, and I'm going to carry it. Okay, maybe he didn't do so great at that. He was really good, though, at sending men off to war to die and taking women as his wives and taxing and land. and Yeah, he was good at all that. Jesus is coming on a donkey this morning, also as a bit of a symbol. Yeah, we could read from, from Zechariah that uh, warfare is no more, in verse 10, that there will be peace from sea to sea. So he's coming as a gesture of peace, true. But how's he going to make that peace? Through himself. He's there absorbing all the sin of the people around him so that he can carry the full weight of all the sin of those people and of you and me and take it to the cross. We also read here um, that the real reason, like we've already stated, that everyone was coming out to Jesus was because of this miracle of seeing Lazarus raised from the dead. And the, the Pharisees get, uh, get uptight about this. <laughs> they get uptight, Why? Uh, because they were the ones that were supposed to be leading the people. It's not just because their popularity is waning, though. No, it, it, it's because I think deep down they realize that they don't have anything to offer. See, you can love the law of the Lord all you want to, but the law can never give to you what the law commands from you. Only Jesus can give what is demanded of you and me. Um, I've been with One several times, driving in the car, where uh, people look at me and speak to me in any number of languages, and I don't have a clue what they're talking about. And luckily, he's a really good translator. Um, he can translate almost any situation for me. Uh, Tara also works as my translator. My translator, Like when I say, Phew, what I need right now is just a whole tub of mint chocolate chip ice cream, she says, how about I make you supper instead? Uh, okay, well, that's, that's fine. That's good. Mint chocolate chip ice cream would be better, but okay, I'll take, I'll take a good homemade dinner. That's good too, yeah. <laughs> This is what Jesus is really doing for everyone this morning. He's translating all those needs that you think that you have. He's translating them into, uh, oh, oh, I just need to be saved from this, this, and this. And Jesus says, I will save you from your sin, from Satan, from death, from forever separation from God. I'll save you from yourself sinner. He's translating their needs into what is real and what is true. Everyone that was on that, that parade that morning, everyone that was a part of it, Jesus was there to forgive them, not because of their righteousness according to the law, 
but because of his righteousness. One of the things that the Pharisees say here that is distracting, maybe, to say the least, is you see you're gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone out after him. Oh, man, this is kind of a triggering phrase for me, all right? It's triggering for a couple different reasons. John, in his gospel, uses this phrase, world, all the time. One of the times that uh, he uses this, this phrase, world, is back in John chapter 4. He's speaking to Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus under darkness. He's a, a ruler of the law. He's someone that uh, is in charge of a synagogue, a temple. Uh, he's important. He's important. And he comes to Jesus, and what does he say to Jesus? He says, uh, teacher, oh, oh, good teacher. Here's what I don't want you to do this morning. I don't want you to come to Jesus as teacher this morning. Here's what I also don't want you to do this morning. I don't want you to think, hmm, wait, I really learned a lot from that. I don't want you to learn a lot from what I have to say this morning, okay? <laughs> what I want you to do is hear Jesus proclaiming himself to you. See, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says, oh, good teacher. And they go through this whole conversation. And then finally, Jesus says to Nicodemus, um, Nicodemus, did you know that God so loves the world that he gave his only son? That's good. I like it. I like it. And yet, Nicodemus hears something about the world, and he's like, hmm, okay, good teacher. Interesting. I think I'll take note of that. Yeah? The woman at the well comes just after that, and she says essentially to Jesus, are you him? Are you, are you the guy that we're waiting for? And he says, I'm he. That's me. You're Messiah? That's me. What, what did Nicodemus want? He wanted a teacher. He wanted something, someone that could learn him something. What did the woman at the well want? She wanted to be forgiven for her sins. What she needed was a savior, someone that was going to come to her and say, I'm for you. And so why is this triggering for me? <laughs> it's because the Pharisees don't get it. Oh, can you believe this? The whole world's going out, out after him. Jesus all along has been saying to them, no, no, I'm here for you. You think the world is coming after me? I've been here for you. Nicodemus didn't need to hear God so loved the world. He needed to hear God so loved you, but it wasn't what he wanted from Jesus. So this morning, Jesus is marching into the city saying that salvation, saying that that, that that salvation that you and I, that we're crying out for and the world is going after, <laughs> those things will not come to you according to the law. Those things will not come to you according to your sacrifice. He's saying to you and me this morning, it's going to take me being the donkey, carrying all the weight of your sin and going to the cross for you. It was read for us this morning, but let me read it for us one more time from Philippians chapter 2. This is a, an early confession of the church, if you want to say it like that. Though he was God, he did, did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself 
in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God lifted him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is being led up, not the Temple Mount where he can sit on a throne and declare his kingship. No, he's being led up a different hill this week. A hill where he will be placed upon his throne. We call it a cross. And on that cross, he will give himself for your sins. Jesus is just, he's justifying and he's saving. And he's here this morning doing that for you. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he freely gave of himself and willingly carried our sin for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.